Good day, mates, and hello again, friends. As you can see, to the right of me and to the left of me, I've gathered six friends that come from the land down under. Today's feature is going to be on Australian wines. Before we do that, I would like to pick one of them out and have a little toast with you. Listen to the little bit different sound. Start out with our nice glass here. So it won't be proper to get started without saying cheers and welcome. It's very good. I'll tell you what it is in just a minute. I decided to uh, come back to doing a country again, actually a continent. I haven't featured one in a while, and I felt that uh, over the last year or so, I have been avoiding, not avoiding, but um, just never got around to going down to the land down under. So today, that is exactly what we're going to do. Now, in talking about Australia, it's very important. I could probably sit here for an hour and a half and do a documentary on Australian wines. I promise you, I'm not going to do that today. So when you're talking about an entire continent, my goal in my format here is just to summarize and highlight for you um, what are some things that you can expect to find should you decide to explore Australian wine, which is always my goal in these spots, to have you enjoy and explore something that you may not have or to add some layers to some wines that you have already explored uh, from the region that I discuss. So what I will do to try to um, corral that whole continent into a, hopefully keep this around 20 minute conversation is I will use the wines that I'm featuring here today to take you through some of the aspects of Australian winemaking that make it unique because there are a few unique things about Australian wine and it actually started at the beginning of this presentation and I'll see if you pick up on it when I actually talk about it. So. When you talk about Australian wines, I find that um, a lot of people, they think of that they've been called critter wines because of wines like Yellowtail, which are all over the shelves in PA and all over the shelves across the country. Australia does produce a lot of wine. You probably heard of Jacob's Creek. You may have heard a little bit, if you're a little bit into wine, of Penfold, which I have here on the table today. You may have even heard of Lindenman's. So those are some of the Australian wines that you'll see on the shelves, maybe a little penguin as well. What I'm here to tell you today is that there's more to Australian wine than just Jacob's Creek and Yellowtail. If you like Yellowtail and Jacob's Creek, they actually make some really decent wines. But I'm suggesting to you that for a few dollars more, you can bump up into some really exciting Australian wines that you may not have had before. And we're not really going to get into anything in terms of grapes that you haven't heard of before, but each terroir, as I've mentioned, all over the globe, offers up some kind of special uh, aspect to its wines that you don't get other places. So let's have at it and let's take our way through Australia. So the, let me talk first about the Australian wine regions. And if you look at Australia and visualize it on the map, and I'll post some stuff for you for background, for those of you who like to read and peruse uh, internet sites, um, most of the wine regions are on the southern border of the continent of Australia. They are South Australia, which is kind of in the center, right around what we would consider the Texas area in our country. There's New South Wales, which is a little bit further uh, east of uh, South Australia wine region. Then there's the Victoria region, which is over on the, the, the coast. And then there's the Western Australian region uh, that um, is, is important for um, really a lot of good Chardonnay coming from that region. I'm not going to go into um, all of the sub-regions or the GIs as they call them. As you know, in uh, Italy, they call them Doc G's, hence a little play on my name. Uh, in France, they call them a, uh, in French, they call them AOCs. Uh, in Spain, they call them DOs, Denominación de Origen. Um, in America, we call them, in the United States, AVAs, American Viticultural Areas. In Australia, they call them GIs, Geographic Indication. 
So um, there are 47 GIs in the, um, on the continent and in the four or five major wine regions that comprise, that are found in Australia. So it's not my intent here, we would be here forever to go through all of those. I'll point them out through the lines as I can and uh, then we'll go from there. So um, just to reiterate, all of the wine growing, the outback is pretty much up in the north. The southern coast uh, is where the uh, wine regions are in Australia. So what kind of grapes can you expect to find coming out of Australia? Their number one, the thing that Australia is really famous for is their Shiraz. Shiraz, they call it, to give it a little bit of a twist. It's really the Syrah grape, and we'll talk about that when I open the bottle of Syrah or Shiraz that I have here on the table. But Shiraz and Chardonnay make up 45% of their wine production. Uh, they also are a good climate for Cabernet Sauvignon. I have one of those here for you today. They also do some work with Pinot Noir because they do make sparklings. Um, Australian Champagne, if you will. You know, you're not supposed to call it that, but we can do that here on Doc G Spots. So they do mix Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and make some very fantastic uh, sparkling ones. I did not have one, and I'll be honest with you, they're hard to find. And I looked high and low to find one, but I promise you there is a sparkling here today, and I'm going to save that for the end. Uh, they also do Sauvignon Blanc. They also do fantastically with Riesling. I have one on the table today. Many years ago when I started getting into Australian wines, Rieslings was one of the reasons that I really started to like Australian wines. Their Rieslings are world class and uh, they're a little bit different style than the other places around the world where you get them, including from the Alsace region in France, from Germany, from the Rhine Valley, and also from the Finger Lakes. And even in California, they do Rieslings. The Australian Riesling is very distinct. Uh, Australia is also doing things with Sauvignon Blanc, and they're also doing things, uh, as I said, with um, Chardonnay. So, and they also grow other sub-varieties, Merlot, uh, Muscat, uh, Viognier, uh, in much lesser quantities. So I'm not going to name every, but just know that you can probably find whatever grape you want. Outside of a few uh, grapes that grow specifically in certain regions of the world, Australia is a continent, remember that, and they have a lot of uh, vineyards and um, wine growing and wine making going on in that country. So with that said, and well, my goal here to try to keep this as succinct as possible, let me start with the first, we're going to go white and then we'll go to red. And if you noticed, if you picked up on it when I started the show, you heard that little crack sound. Well, that was the crack of what is called the Stelvin cap. And one of the things in Australia, and I'm Every wine that I have here on the table today, except for the last one, has no corks, no cork. There's no corkscrew involved here today. It's all twist off. And Australia has been one of the forerunners and one of the people that, one of the people, one of the uh, wine areas that started the use of the Stelvin Cat. And to be quite honest with you, they keep wines fresh. As some would argue that it keeps it more uh, oxygen free then cork. Very, very little opportunity for any leakage because this is sealed. When you hear it crack open, which you're going to hear here a number of times today, uh, you'll see that. So I'm going to start with our very first wine for you. It's in the glass. This is called the Y Series Sauvignon Blanc. And the region here, I'm not going to, I'm going to accent it every time, but every wine I have here to prove to you how important this region is, is from South Australia. I have had wines from other regions. I just didn't have any in the array of wines that I picked out for you today. I've had fantastic Chardonnay from the Margaret River um, region GI in Western Australia region. Fantastic Chardonnay coming out of Australia. So let's start off with this Sauvignon Blanc. I had poured a little bit. Let's pour a little bit more and we'll talk about its flavor profile. And then I'll give you some highlights from the bottle and then we'll move on. This one I happen to get at um, Total Wine. You can probably find one here in PA. I did some research for you in advance and I went to the PA Wine and Spirits web shop. There are 300, almost 400 different Australian wines in the state PA Wine and Spirits shops um, in their uh, inventory. So you can go and you know, 
most of them, unfortunately, I think are yellowtail. And again, I don't want to talk down to anyone, but you can do better than yellowtail. Pump it up a couple bucks and go for um, any one of these kind of grapes that I'm talking to you about today. And take a, take a chance and see what you, what, what you get. So the Sauvignon Blanc, very light, a little bit of citrus. It's not like your New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, which is just around the corner from Australia. Fruity, citrusy, very dry, very dry, very good. So this comes from a winery called the Yalumba Winery. It is in the South Australia wine region. And this is a uh, wine that they're doing a lot with um, biodiversity in Australia and um, green farming, which has been very important. Australian winemakers, and if you would go on to their just go on to australiawine.com and you'll find it, how they're doing exciting things with dry farming and trying to keep uh, biodiverse in their wine efforts. This wine has spring grass aromas leading to a burst of lemon sherbet flavor, followed by the lingering taste of pawpaw and mango. I've never had a pawpaw, I've had a mango. And it is very delicate. So this is the 2020 Yalumba Y-Series Sauvignon Blanc from the South Australia wine region. And we'll set that one aside, move our glass aside, and we'll move on to our second one. Now remember, Chardonnay, it makes up, um, along with Shiraz, 40%, 45% of the grapes grown um, on the continent. So this is a South Australia Chardonnay from the Thorn Clark Winery. That's a popular name. I used to drink their uh, Rieslings. I couldn't find them again. And it's 13% alcohol. This again comes from the South Australia region. Now listen to this. It's not a cork crack, but screw top, just like that. And it does, it's very convenient. If you don't drink all the wine, you put it right back on, seal it up tight. And I do think it helps keep, keep wines longer. But we're not gonna keep this one right now. We're going to pour it and sample it and see what we got here. Nice gold color. It's 2018, so it's been in the bottle a little bit. Mmm. A little vanilla on the nose. Probably a little bit malolactic fermentation. Mmm. Nice. Okay, a little bit of oak on there. A little bit of lees, a little bit of yeast. That's a very good wine. And again, this was a $16 bottle of wine from the South Australia region. And it says this one is medium body, which I can attest to. Fruit driven, which I can attest to. Melon and peach flavors. That's what gives it that full body, a little bit round on the palate. And it, it goes very well with the typical things that you would have with Chardonnay, seafood, pasta, chicken, Asian cuisine. Um, and pasta meaning in, in some kind of white sauce, probably. I don't think I'd pair this up with uh, pasta and tomato sauce. Maybe if it's fresh tomato, but not the, the real heavy uh, pasta sauce. So there is an example, one example, just one, of many Australian Chardonnays. Yellowtail makes one. Jacob's Creek makes one. I've had it. I've had Jacob's Creek sparkling um, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. It was like $8 a bottle back when I used to be able to find it. If you can find it, buy it. It's, it's actually really, really very good. It's one of the things you would get a good QPR coming out of Australia. They're not cheap wines, believe me. If you go and do the research and some of the, the big Syrahs, or it's not the Shiraz, that they uh, market from uh, Australia and some of their red blends, uh, they do plenty of red blends. Uh, if you, you can spend six, seven hundred dollars on one bottle of Australian wine. So don't get the, the, the impression that we're talking yellowtail cheap here. There's some really good wine and at a good price point. You get good wine. These first two are very good. I drink these regularly. And now to seal it back up, to preserve this wine. I certainly can't drink all of that at one time, but I can drink some more of it.
definitely getting that peach and melon mixture there. Very round, medium body. Um, if you like real crisp Chardonnay, this isn't one. An Australian Chardonnay, uh, unless you get it on oak, is very typical of that profile. So let's move on to the third wine for today, and that is the Riesling. This Riesling comes from the Clare Valley GI, which is in South Australia. And um, I've never had this one, so again, here we go. Crack it open, and let's pour. Before I read the notes, let me do it myself. A little lighter. Swirl it around, let it release its essence. Hmm. Riesling has that uh, traditional petrol smell. A little bit, of, it's like gas. It's not bad. It's not off-putting. This has it. Wow. Hmm. Very crisp. Very light. Not very sweet. One of the things that you really want to try to balance in a Riesling is how crisp and minerally it is versus how um, how sweet it can get. And when you hit that sweet spot, that's when Riesling is really very, very good. So this one is called the 2019 Lodge Hill Riesling from the Jim Barry Winery uh, in, a, in South Australia in the uh, Lodge Hill Clear Valley area. And it says the um, wine is grown at 480 meters and it is exposed to sunlight and cool nights for slower ripening. And it's very zesty and vibrant and it has a crisp, acidic freshness to it. I can tell you it's not a fruit bomb, it's, but if you like dry, crisp wines, that, and the reason these are good is that they pair with just about anything that you would have with white wine. This is fantastic. The nose is opening up a little bit more. You are getting a little bit of citrus coming out. A little spillage there. Mm, that's very good. A little apple actually on it. So let's close up James Barry. And that sums up a little bit of a walk through the white wines of Australia. So now let's move over to um, I'm going to do the Cabernet Sauvignon first because I want to spend a little bit of time on Shiraz because it really is Australia's probably its signature grape. So the first wine, never had this one, from Victoria Park. This is a Cabernet Sauvignon. That familiar crack again. Nice color, very dark. Got a chance to open up a little bit. Now I have not decanted these, so remember there's going to be a little bit of a, a difference when you decant these and, and let the air hit them for a little while. Ooh, mmm, blackberry, blueberry, it smells really good. Fantastic. Never had that before. It's a little Needs a little air, but beyond that, the fruit profile is absolutely gorgeous. Very soft tannin. You won't get this one in PA, but just go look for maybe a Jacobs Creek Cabernet Sauvignon from Australia. Ten bucks. This one was only twelve, and that was a total wine. Now, as I always like to do, let me put that fancy looking cap back on here. It says the grapes for this premium wine have been sourced from sustainably managed vineyards within South Australia. Deep purple in color. The palate is true to the variety, which I can attest to. It would taste like any other cab. And um, you get dark berries, chocolate, and spice. I get actually, um, I get a little bit of uh, blackberry, blueberry. It's very fruity, a little bit different than the more austere French and California style. Very smooth, soft tannin finish, and says this wine matches perfectly with beef fillet or roast lamb, as you might expect. Victoria Park, 2019. Go look yourself for a nice Australian Cabernet Sauvignon. We're going to set that one aside. 
And now we're going to take a little bit of time to talk about the signature grape from um, Australia. And that is the grape called Shiraz. So if you go onto the internet, you can say, well, people will say, what's the difference between Syrah and Shiraz? Again, whenever you have the same grape, it's generally a stylistic, regional thing that is promoted really by two things, the terroir, the kind of ground, and uh, the climate that it grows in. And then the uh, really three things, and then the influence of the winemakers based on the kind of fruit that they get. And I can tell you, the, the main difference between the Syrah that comes from Northern Rhone, which is where it basically originated, that's grown in uh, the Rhone Valley in France, all over it. Uh, it's grown in uh, Central Coast, California. It's grown in Washington State. It's grown in South America. The version in um, Australia tends to be bigger, meaning higher ABV. Just a quick look here. This one is 14.5. I've had enough Syrah to know that you generally don't see Syrah come through that big because it's a delicate wine. Well, I can tell you, down in Australia, it's not delicate. It's big and bad. And uh, we're about to find out how big and bad it is with this Penfolds. This Penfolds, I think, is available in PA as well. I bought this at Total Wine in Delaware as well. This comes from South Australia, and it comes from the oldest winery on the continent, Penfolds. This wine company also sells some very seriously expensive wines. So you can check that out on your own. Here's our crack again. Let's pour a little glass of this. Very dark. Syrahs are not that dark. This is called Penfolds Kununga Hill, South Australia, 2019. So it's young, it could age, but we're gonna just take this straight out of the, I've never had this. I've had Australian Shiraz. This is not one of them. <laughs> not that I can recall. Mmm, mm, that's big. Getting some um, definite dark berries, blue, black, maybe a little mulberry. It's fruity. When I say fruity, it's not sweet. A wine that's 14.5 ABV is not sweet. It's, it's big. It's got a lot of alcohol in it because that means there was a lot of sugar in it, which makes it very fruity. Oh my God, mm. what an explosion of fruit. I can't even describe that. Mm. Let's do that again. It's like cherry, strawberry, blueberry. It's like a fruit compote. Mm. That's really good. So let's see what they had to say. They called it an opulent red Shiraz. And opulent is absolutely the key word. They're beautifully captured. Now what they do with a lot of these wines in South Australia is they source them. They call it a blend, but it's all Shiraz grapes. They just source the wines, or excuse me, the grapes from different vineyards all over the wine region, which is common. It's done here in the United States. I know it's done in Finger Lakes when they make their Rieslings. They, they source different vineyards and then the winemaker just markets it out as a wine from their winery. But remember, it all starts in the, in, the, in the vineyard. So they take different vineyards. This is mainly representative of an important GI, geographic indication, in Australia called the Barossa Valley. And most of the Syrah, or Shiraz, came from the Barossa Valley for this with some other um, areas as well. You might wonder where I find all this out. I don't pick up the phone and call Australia. If you look up any wine, they generally have a tech sheet that tells you and gives you all the information that would bore you to death if you're not really into that. But because I want to sound uh, like I know what I'm talking about, I go do that research for you and pass it on. So that is the 2019 Penfolds Canunga Hill. If you see a Penfolds Red or they make a Chardonnay, pick it up. You, you won't go wrong. I'm telling you. Graduate from Yellowtail. And I'm sorry if I'm insulting you, but there are better Australian wines out there than just Yellowtail. And for our PS the Resistance tonight, before we leave, one of the features of um, one of the signature wines coming out of 
um, Australia, among others, is a wine called a sparkling Shiraz. And I have yet to feature a sparkling red. And I mean a dark red grape. They used to call these sparkling burgundy, but the wine worlds had some legal issues and they told them they couldn't call it sparkling burgundy anymore. But you can get sparkling red. Italy does a sparkling Lambrusco. Um, I just picked up a sparkling Nebbiolo. Now that's a little bit paler. This is a sparkling Shiraz. It is a little bit lighter in effervescence, but it's made the same way. I have to do this for you. The only thing that was not a twist cap, although we are twisting here. <laughs> Wonderful sound. And we're ending the show with that this time. Now this is the same grape that's in this pen fold, except they put a red wine through a secondary fermentation and they made it in the method, the method de traditionnel, or the traditional method, which means it's made just like champagne. It's not champagne, but the secondary fermentation occurs in the bottle after it's gone through its first fermentation. And it is a 13% ABV, so it's not dry, although they say, and let's pour this. If you can see it, maybe you can see it there. You can see, look at that beautiful red bubble. The slight effervescence in that. It's red bubbly, my friend. Red, not rosé. Red bubbly. So let's see what this tastes like. Surprisingly very light on the nose. Oh my. Mm. Very, very soft. When it goes down, very light. It kind of tamps down the, the, um, the powerfulness of the Shiraz. Uh, I mean, this is, it's full bodied. It's fruit with tannin, sweetness, and bubbles. It comes across a little bit sweet. Oh, my. This, I could have this with a steak. Wow. If you closed your eyes, you might not know you're sipping a red wine here. That's how smooth and soft this is. So, my apologies. What is it we're talking about? This one happens to come from the Chook, one of the winemakers, and it's available on wine.com. I didn't see it on PA, although it might be available. Um, I know it's available at Total Wine because that's where I bought it. You can get it between 15 to 22, depending on where you would go for it. It's not cheap, but Jacob's Creek makes one. I don't know if you'll find it. There are other places that make uh, sparkling um, Shiraz as well. You want to change it up with your friends, I highly, highly recommend that you give that one a try. So, I apologize. I didn't keep this to 20 minutes. It's hard to cover a continent in less than that. So, without any further delay, I'd like to say thank you for joining me. Stay tuned for our next episode, which will be the lead-in, <sighs> unfortunately, <laughs> to the unofficial end of summer when we get ready to celebrate Labor Day. So until then, good day mates and cheers.